Well, hello there. I'm Park Howell, and welcome to the Northern Arizona office of the Business of Story. This is where I do all my hanging out and working, other than through a couple doors over there where my recording studio is for the Business of Story podcast. Now, two weeks ago, I was fortunate enough to lure onto the show Grammy artist Freddie Ravel. He is a remarkable keyboardist. He was the music director for Earth, Wind & Fire. He's played with Carlos Santana, Lady Gaga, J-Lo. I mean, the who's who of pop and rock and roll. And he is the founder of Life in Tune. So he was coming onto the show, or did come onto the show, to talk about that intersection of music, melody, harmony, and rhythm, and business storytelling and how you find the harmony and rhythm in your stories to be able to connect with your audiences and convert them to customers. Well, we had a bit of a technical difficulty on Squadcast, which wasn't working, so we had to jump back over to Zoom. And in doing that, I was able to capture that interview live on video. So I decided, even though the show came out this week in a regularly scheduled Business of Story podcast, I'm going to share with you the video, the impromptu video from that day, bringing you Freddie Ravel and his amazing musicianship and storytelling in living color. Check it out. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the business of story, Freddie Ravel. Man, so great to have you here. Great to be with you, Park. Great to be here, man. <laughs> you know, our good friend, Shep Hyken, introduced oh, yeah. us and said, I told him, I said, I in 2021, I'm looking for more musicians to talk about their craft and how we can all use it store in our storytelling and you know i had kenny aronoff here in show number 277 rock and roll's hardest hitting man a great drummer and then just had scott page on not too long ago on show number 299 and i am so delighted to have you here today primarily because you're a keyboardist my life yeah. oh listen park i mean just to be speaking with you and to see an old fender Rhodes behind you is just you know done. Yeah, that's a 73 yeah, and I got it in 199. No, nine. When did I get 1978? I bought it and I took it on the road with me to college, and I've had it ever since. Awesome. Ah, good stuff. <laughs> man. Good stuff. So glad to have you here because you have a remarkable music background that I can't even come close to understanding, and I totally appreciate your skill is unbelievable. And now you are, I don't know, not transitioning so much, but bringing those talents of music into the world of what you call the connection economy. And that's what we are going to be talking about today. And I think maybe the biggest thing I want my listeners to know is you don't need to be a musician to appreciate this show. You probably already love your own kinds of music and have your playlists and whatever. But musicians have taught me so much over my career that I just... So happy to have a guy like you here, Freddie, to help inform us. How can we use what you know about music in our own lives to find that melody, harmony, and rhythm in the stories we tell? So, well, first of all, Park, thank you for having me. And, and a big shout out to your entire audience out there in the uh, internet universe. Um, I'm very happy to celebrate what I think is the, you know, truly the world's oldest language, music. It's something that every human being has um, by virtue of a very simple fact. We have a heartbeat and the heart is our, this internal drummer that is going on constantly. We also have a, a connection to rhythm in the way our bodies are living in our circadian rhythms, right? In the way we use our daily life when we get up in the morning, when we have our meals, when we exercise, when we fall asleep. The way we're in sync with the planet or out of sync with the planet 
is really a form of how we choose to use rhythm. So um, melody, harmony, and rhythm, those three things that you mentioned, are actually the three basic roots of all music. Any, anything you can imagine. Uh, if you're into EDM, it's got a melody, harmony, and rhythm. If you're into Frank Sinatra, it's got melody, harmony, and rhythm. If you're into Stevie Wonder, Adele, Lady Gaga, Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, Chopin, the blues, R&B, country, funk, rock, you know, loud rock and roll, melody, harmony, rhythm. So it's in every single element, and it doesn't matter what country you come from. It doesn't matter what culture you come from. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It's a consistent rule of music, these three elements. And thereby, everyone's playlist, everything that everyone individually listens to, that in their own opinion is their favorite music, right? Because I'm not here to talk about what music I think is better than another. That's not the issue. What we're talking about is the universal property of all music is constructed on melody, harmony, and rhythm. And once you understand how universal that is, then you can start to understand that the melody takes on a lead position in music. Um, it tends to be the part, if I ask uh, you, Park, how do you sing You Are the Sunshine of My Life by Stevie Wonder? You by... don't want to hear that from me. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Everyone mute, because I'm going to sing it, right? <laughs> you are the sunshine of my life, right? Or if you, or if you sing uh, Adele, I, you know, da 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 Da, 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 da. Right, rolling in the deep. Uh, if, if, if you listen to anything, and I ask you any song you can imagine, you're going to hum the melody. You're going to sing the melody. And because of that, the melody is the identity of the song. Right? Uh, this is the way, by the way, this is the way software like uh, Shazam works. It's, it's looking for the melody. It's the only way it can identify. It can sort of identify it with the rhythm and the harmony, but it needs the melody to really know the identity. So I use the melody park to talk about the identity of a leader, not just a leader in music, but as a leader. And to all your audience out there, those of you, when, you're, when you sit in the chair and you're making decisions about where to go with, let's say, your relationship, your, your relationship at work, your relationship personally, uh, all the steps you're taking to, to proclaim the I am of who you are, what you stand for, you are projecting your melody, your desires, your leadership. So the melody is you. The melody is who you are. Look in the mirror, everybody. That's your melody. And I've been using that for the last 20 years in my corporate presentations, speaking to IBM or Google or you know, Bank of America or Blue Cross or NASA, you know, all these different groups that I've had the honor to speak to, and we've done it in 82 countries so far, um, these principles are working. So the melody is the leadership. The harmony is an act of collaboration. So that's two or more notes. And rhythm is time, tempo. All right, we will explore all of that a little bit more, but give us a little bit about your backstory, Freddie. How did you find yourself in the music world in the first place? Is it something you always wanted to do as a kid? Or did it kind of find you? Um, it, it, it found me. Um, I, initially, I was very interested in, in playing music with lots of rhythm. I'm a rhythm. I'm crazy about beats and rhythm. And we, as a little kid, a little toddler, were you just pounding oh, on everything? Always pounding on stuff. And uh, even in school, I got in trouble because I would, I would be drumming on the desk. And I'd be playing, you know, I mean, the, the teacher would actually call me and says, uh, Freddie, please stop pounding on the desk. And I went, okay, no problem. You know, and, and, I, and you know, I would get busted and my parents were like, what are we going to do? You know, and I realized, they realized that what I needed to do was to start playing a musical instrument. So um, I ended up initially taking up the accordion. The accordion? Uh, the were accordion. your folks into music? My, my folks, um, my mother is from Colombia, South America. And uh, if you're from Colombia, you kind of grow up with the cumbia in your DNA. You're kind of like, you're kind of dancing the moment you're born. It's, it's a country that 
dancing and the cumbia is a huge aspect of life over there to the point where a lot of young kids are in schools that are built around teaching the cumbia. Just like in Brazil, they have a thing called the Scola of the Samba. A lot of kids are playing Samba as they grow up. It doesn't matter where they economically come from. They're, they play the Samba. So in, in Colombia, it's the cumbia. So my mother grew up practically dancing when she was still in diapers. And she's 82 years old today, and she still dances in the kitchen while she cooks, still to this day. <laughs> so I grew up with this intense rhythm, uh, not just the cumbia, but everything Latin, salsa, rumba, merengue, samba, you know, and there's many other styles of Latin music. My father is a Russian, German, Polish guy from the Bronx. Okay. Russian, German, Polish guy from the Bronx. Did he play an instrument? No, but uh, he, he did take up guitar and he, he attempted to. <laughs> My father is a, um, is a rather metaphysical man, a, a doctor, a retired doctor now. He's 85 and he's still going strong. The thing my father uh, is really about is contributing and, uh, new, and, and he's about thought leadership in his own way. He even has his own website called Grandpedia, like Wikipedia, but Grandpedia. <laughs> And or what, the of, grandpas of the world or what? Right. And that, well, the idea is to, is to provide uh, wisdom from the elders uh, to the new generation. And so I'm very proud of my dad um, for, you know, at 85, he's just going strong. So uh, the combination of a father like that and then a mother who just knows how to, you know, make music and dance and celebrate life. But the put, accordion, man, what happened there? <laughs> Well, what happened is there was a, now you ready for this? It's a true story, door-to-door -door salesman, knocking on doors. I answer the door, I'm seven years old. He looks down at me, he says, son, you, you wanna play music? I go, I'd love to play music. He goes, what do you wanna play? I go, I, well, I like the organ because the organ has these little buttons on it. And if you push the button, it goes, or if you push this, it goes bossa nova. And I thought, oh, I love these rhythms. And he says, son, I get it, but you're too short to reach the pedals. So why don't you play the accordion? And then in about a year or so, you'll get a little taller. You can reach the pedals. You can play the organ. And that was enough. That was enough for me to, to say, OK, let's do it. And a week later, I was enrolled in accordion school. Well, and the accordion is the one keyboard that enables you to dance around and have your rhythm playing all around the room while you're playing. You're, you're hitting that squeeze box. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the, it's an old world instrument and it's weird you you know i can still play it but i haven't played one in frankly i haven't picked up my accordion in, in the last couple of years but but i put it on and lady of spain comes out of me i guys suddenly i can play polkas and and uh things but i started on that instrument then i switched over to the piano when i was 10 and then after that that was it the piano was just like oh, 88 keys of love a whole orchestra at your fingertips, the full range of the orchestra, from the lowest of lows to the highest of highs, complete polyphony, right? Polyphony, for those of you who don't know what that means, polyphony means you can play as many notes as you want to at one time. You know, on a flute, you can only play one, or one note. On a guitar, you can play six, but on a piano, you can play all of them. Can you give us an example on your keyboard right there? Well, sure. So here's my keyboard, right? Um, I have 88 keys from my lowest all the way, going all the way up, all the way up to here. 88 keys from the low to the high. A guitar doesn't have that range. A flute only has, you know, um, all the other instruments have a far more limiting range. Piano is full. So I, if I play a song like Summertime, for example, Like that. I'm playing polyphony. Right there, I just probably played about 20 notes. Because I hold a sustain pedal down and they're all ringing. Can't do that on any other instrument, right? Um, if I want to play the melody down here. 
melody in the middle. So I'm playing the melody in the middle, but I'm accompanying myself as though I had a flute player with me and I can still play the melody. You can't do that with any other instrument, everybody. You just can't. So it allows you to have conversations. Left hand. Right hand. Right? Mozart. Right? And so on, right? It allows you to play any kind of style you can imagine, right? Boogie woogie. Right? You can play all kinds of different styles on it. You could also play something that's incredibly tender and incredibly emotional, right? You can play something that's just, uh, you know, I would even ask you to make suggestions and I can just try to come up with something on the spot. But the point is, it's an instrument that is like having a massive white canvas in front of you. And you can say, Chi, I think I feel yellow today. And I'll go kind of in a happiness mode. Hey, today I feel kind of melancholy and down. Maybe I'll go in a more uh, melancholy mode or retrospection. You know? Freddie, when you were learning this as a young man, were you a gifted musician or did it come by just pure love and hard work sitting at that keyboard hours upon hours every day? Um, I think I, I was, uh, first of all, I was, uh, I think the word is I was utterly fascinated with the feeling of, of, of chords and harmony and the, and the sexiness, the mojo of rhythm. I always, I, I think it's just fascinating how those things feel. So I would say I was led by passionate curiosity is number one. Number two, um, I would also say very sed seduced. I find it, I find it very seductive. Music is intoxicating to me. Um, it, it, it offers an alternate reality. When I'm playing the piano, I'm not thinking about timing. I'm not thinking about what, where I am. I'm thinking about the present moment. So I think when you think about the, I, and, and this is what they try to teach people throughout the world is be in the moment, right? The power of now, Eckhart Tolle, right? Mm -hmm. The emphasis is on being present with each other. So because of my training as a musician my whole life, I believe when I go into the world of human potential, the, one of the greatest things we can teach each other is the importance of being present. So the way that translates in this moment, I go in my heart and in my brain, I'm saying, I'm with my brother, Park Hal. There is nothing more important there's no, uh, in, than this moment that I'm alive and I'm on this podcast with Park and our hearts are beating and we're talking and we're exchanging ideas and that's it. There's n I'm, I'm not thinking of the, of the future or the past, I'm in the present. And music has trained me to be in the present and I, I apply that to my human relationships. When did you get your big break? I mean, were you always thinking that you would be a professional musician and get to tour the world with these amazing bands and be the music director of Earth, Wind and & Fire and hang out on the silver screen with Madonna and others? I mean, was that your goal or did that just kind of happen too, purely through your love and passion for music? Uh, the latter, you know, you don't sit there at the age of 14 and go, I'm going to play with Earth, Wind & Fire. You, <laughs> but you do think, at least I was thinking, let me, let me do everything I can to master the instrument. Let me do exercises. Let me be able to do exercises so that as I'm carrying on a conversation, as I'm talking to you, I can keep talking to you while I'm playing exercise and continue to think in a different brain while I'm performing so that I can keep dialogue going and, you know, pat my head and, you know, turn, turn a circle on my tummy at the same time. I think it's important to make it automatic so that you're painting while your brain can go somewhere else. Um, so that was something I worked on and I practiced about 10 hours a day when I was going to college, partially because I felt very behind. I felt like I had to to catch up with other people because I didn't start on the piano, I started on the accordion. So 
I had to make up for lost time. <laughs> and uh, I was next to these, I remember these little, these little girls from Japan that had, that had enrolled in my university that were killing me. They were just like playing Rachmaninoff at the age of 17. And I was like just trying to get through a C major arpeggio, you know. So uh, I had to practice really hard. Did you study music in, in college? Yeah, I have a Bachelor of Arts degree in classical piano. Okay. And uh, I, I practiced all kinds of different classical pieces from Bartok to Beethoven to Bach to Stravinsky to, you know, everything. Scarlatti, <laughs> Haydn, you know, uh, Stockhausen, uh, Arnold Schwarnberg, you know, 20th <laughs> century music. I, everything they throw at you in college, I went through all those things. Yeah. But I also played in Los Angeles at Cal State Northridge, which had one of the greatest music departments in the country at that time, largely because of its proximity to Hollywood. And we had, um, at the time, the Tonight Show band, what Johnny Carson, was coming to my school and giving us clinics. So, you mean Doc Severinsen in the game? Doc Severinsen, Ross Tompkins on piano, Ed Shaughnessy on drums, Louis Belson showing up at our school, Jack Sheldon on trumpet. These are all, at the time, these were the legends of the LA studio scene. And what a lot of your listeners may not know is back then you could enter the, you could become a studio musician, which was considered the highest honor and achievement in the world of music. In let, short of becoming a rock and roll artist, becoming a studio musician means that uh, you can read everything, you can play everything, you could be called for a TV show with a chase scene and start playing the music that the film score wants you to do. Or you could sit down and play Nashville country piano on the, the next hour uh, or and everything in between that. So uh, that was my goal while I was going to college was to become an L.A. studio musician. And sure enough, that's what happened. I ended up doing several TV shows in my early 20s, right after I got out of college. And uh, one was the show Fame, yeah. which was a big TV show. Another one was called Airwolf with Ernest Borgnine and I'm playing, I'm playing Fender Rhodes, Mini Moog and piano on, on the soundtracks of these TV shows. And, and back, and I also did a movie called Brewster's Millions, which starred Richard Pryor. And I'm, I think I was 23 or 24 years old. Um, and shortly after that, um, I got uh, introduced to Sergio Mendez and Sergio, while I was doing all the studio work, Sergio Mendez says, hey, Freddie, we're going to play for the King of Thailand. You want to come? And that's, that's an offer. You just, you don't say, I'm going to think about it. You just say, well, yeah. And I was on an airplane the next day and we went and played for the King of Thailand. And um, it, that relationship went on for about five, uh, six years working with Sergio Mendez. And um, that led to me getting my first record deal. And I ended up getting my first solo album deal with Polygram Records, which is a division of Universal, which is which to this day is the largest, um, you know, record label in the world. And when I was talking to you, this is be the question for your personal brand in the music business. You know, goes beyond just being a musician. When I talked to Kenny Aronoff, he just outworked everybody. He is like they, you know, in his book, the hardest hitting man in, in show business. He still to this day writes out the scores that he's going to be playing even though he's played them for four decades and uh he just has this energy of this hard-working guy and he even shared the same sort of experience of he always felt like he was behind so he had to outwork everybody scott page he told me what i thought was really interesting he said you know park i was never the best saxophonist out there in fact there are always a lot of other great saxophonists than me but I learned my stage presence and I knew that I had to be in the moment and I brought a presence to it that other saxophonists didn't. And therefore that kind of helped carved out his brand in the music world. What do you feel like, how would you describe your brand that made you so successful in the music business? Um, I thank you part. I, I would have to say almost having a, a having almost you know a life-threatening moment of my life at the age of seven years old i um in that same year that i i started playing the accordion um, i was by myself playing an imaginary game of hide and seek 
in uh, at my um, in my in my house uh, where my parents were, and they had a detached garage, and I walked over to that garage looking for a hiding place, like a curious seven-year-old boy does, right? Thinking, well, where could I hide? You know, where would be a good hiding place? And there was a refrigerator in the back of the garage, and the refrigerator was unplugged. And the door was ajar, and there was nothing in the refrigerator. And I thought, what a cool hiding place. And I climbed into that refrigerator, and I closed the door. And for about the first 15 seconds, Park, I was thrilled. I was like, it's pitch black. It's like hermetically sealed. Nobody can hear me. Nobody can see. This is awesome. And then it came time for me to get out. And I put my, and my right shoulder was already on the inside of the door and I went to push it open uh, like this. I put a big thrust on it and the door didn't open. And um, I tried again and again and the door didn't open. And I started panicking. And of course, at that time, I didn't realize that I had about maybe three minutes of oxygen in that refrigerator. I didn't know that, but I, Nevertheless, kept pushing and pushing and then I calmed down and in the middle of calming down and getting kind of quiet, I actually started hearing a beat in my brain. In, in my head, I started hearing boom, 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 boom. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to sync up with that beat in my brain. And I took my fist and I went against the, the inside of the door of the refrigerator and went boom. Boom, 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 just to calm me down. And I kept doing it, boom, boom, boom. And I don't know, it could have been a minute, two minutes, the door flew open and I'm looking at the shocked expression of my grandmother's face. And I tumble out of the refrigerator into a puddle of my own sweat onto the garage floor. And, <laughs> And what I mean, I apparently we live right next to a freeway, one of those big LA freeways that are like seven lanes in each direction. And there's a lot of white noise, <sighs> you know, the, the sound of traffic. And if I was going, oh, let me get out of here, making noise like panic, I probably would have blended in with the sound of the freeway. But because I deliberately went boom, 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 because I played this deliberate pattern, my my abuelita, as we say in Spanish, walked by, the, walked by and could hear me. And if it wasn't for me playing that rhythm, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you. I, I, would, have, I, I would have perished that day. And, wow. um, and I think that the reason I do what I do is because I really feel that rhythm saved my life. And to this day, even though, um, I mean, I, I've had such a journey in music, working with so many amazing people, but what I'm doing now, Park, with Life in Tune and connecting the dots of melody, harmony, and rhythm, 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 and really driving home that humankind is not using music to its fullest potential. We, we think it's about iTunes and Pandora and Spotify and and, and yes, it is. And yes, concerts are great. And yes, it puts you in a good mood. I'm here to tell you that we're only using about 1% of the power of this awesome art form. And I'm on a mission with my company, with my team, to show people that music is actually not just entertainment, but it's a multitasking power tool that we can use on a daily basis to help us thrive in the connection economy. And what did you then bring to the studio production and these albums and these performances that was uniquely your own through that incident, this, this idea of rhythm th that really made you stand out in the business and how now you are sharing that with the business world to help all of us find that song inside our story. Um, I found, I think, I think what uh, keeps coming back to me is people throughout my life have said, Freddie, you have an ability to do things that are intercultural, intercultural. In other words, 
Uh, right now, you and I, both, we're both Americans. We speak in a similar language. We speak in a similar culture. We're approximately in the same age range, right? So we, the, culturally, we're completely aligned, right? But right now, if we introduce a third person from, let's say, uh, you know, Mumbai, right? And he's in the conversation. Um, I would probably speak, I would adjust the way I'm speaking more in the rhythm of his voice. I'd be listening, I would, in my mind, I would be thinking about the tablas and the sitar and the instruments of India that are, that are different, that have a different flair than American rock and roll drums. And I would be thinking about aligning and mirroring my cultural sense of sound and rhythm with whoever else I'm speaking with. So what happens a lot in this world, especially in Life in Tune, is that when I get called as a keynote speaker or I consult executives, is I talk to them and they talk to me about their challenges of what they're, of diversity, inclusion. These are, these are big areas in our country that everyone's really working on right now. And also how to get on the same page with people from different cultures. And music, and because of the, you know, working with like a Brazilian, like Sergio Mendez, or Earth, Wind and Fire, which is like R&B, a whole encyclopedia of R&B, rhythm and blues, or working with Santana, which is an entire encyclopedia about Africa, Caribbean, South America, you know, the rhythms of all those places. Um, I'm very passionate about all the dots that connect the rhythms of, of all that music. So I often think of instruments of every culture and I use that. So if I'm thinking of, if I'm talking to someone from Cuba or Miami, the congas are in my head. The congas are in my head, right? If I'm talking to someone from Nashville, I might have uh, some slide guitar in my head. If I'm talking to someone from New Orleans, I might have some Louis Armstrong trumpet, right? And people on the surface might go, well, why are you thinking about Louis, Bell, uh, Louis Armstrong? Because, you know, when I think of New Orleans, you know, it's one of, it's considered the birthplace of America's only true art form, jazz. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when people have funerals in New Orleans, they play music and they, they, they get horns together and bass drums and they go down the streets and celebrate the life of the person that passed away. So all of that goes in my consciousness as I'm speaking to somebody from different regions. And I like to consider that, and I have found that to be kind of a secret sauce, if you will, that gets you on the same page and literally in the same rhythm as the person you're, you're trying to close a deal with. You're trying to talk about a marketing plan. You're trying to talk about how you email, text, Snapchat, social media, Zoom calls. Because we're in a world now that has really shrunk more than ever. I mean, in just a matter, and COVID just accelerated all that. So I'm having a lot of people contact me. I'm like, Freddie, we're, I've got a conference call with Shanghai tomorrow. And can you, can we hire you to help us, you know, navigate that world a little bit, you know, because we're going to start a relationship with this company and they like us, but we don't understand when they smile that that means no. <laughs> well, I would, I would imagine business leaders would hear what you have to say and say, I, I can totally get how you do that, Freddie, given your background and your music and your talent and your ability to find that rhythm. But I'm just an international business guy. I don't have that in me. So can you show us or let us hear some of the techniques that you teach for someone out there saying, well, that's all well and good for Freddie, but I could never pull that off because I don't have the chops he's got. Sure. Uh, a lot of it is, is to talk about one of the biggest powers that I think we can leave your listeners today is what I call the space between the notes. Okay. The space between the notes, let's just, uh, when I say notes, I mean musical notes, but let's take music out of it for a second. And let's just talk about the space between your words, right? And the way we converse with each other. 
if you think about people that are considered great communicators like uh, Winston Churchill or Dr. Martin Luther King or uh, some people, you know, Barack Obama, you know, they, they, they stand and they have a presence and the way they communicate has huge impact on audiences, right? A lot of it is the use of the pause. See, if I pause, I'm allowing what I've said to sink in. If I keep speaking really, really quickly and I keep talking to you about ideas and I never give you a chance to take a breath and I don't even take a breath and I keep going, <gasps> whew, nothing sinks in. So it's very important to find your rhythm of your speech and to understand that there's value in space. In the space, here's what space means. I say something and I'm allowing the listener, because I respect them, to nod their head or to smile or to blink their eyes or to give me a signal that they received what I said. And that's the way music is constructed. So you asked me, your question, Park, was how does someone who's a non-musician, who doesn't have a background in music, use this? And I'm going to tell you a technique that we call question and answer and, of course, the space between the words. So. If I say, uh, you know, if, if I, in music, for example, if I play um, dun, 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 right? What is the response to that? Dun, 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 right? Or if I go, yep, yep. Hey, everybody, I just got parked to sing. Okay, here's another one. Here's another one. If I go dun 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 dun, bingo, exactly right. Um, uh, uh, you know, we all live in a yellow submarine. Yellow submarine, yellow submarine. Bingo, there you go. So, see, I, I got parked to sing, everybody. <laughs> um, okay, so here's the point. Every song, most songs are constructed with question and answer, right? We just went from the Beatles to Mozart. But we could be here for multiple lifetimes talking about songs that have a question and an answer. In church, they call it call and response. You know, the choir sings and the, the, the congregation responds, right? We, call and response, question and answer is throughout the history of humankind, right? So when you're speaking to a client, think about, I'm going to make a statement and I'm going to listen to their response. And if I put a certain attitude about it, I'm hoping or perhaps their response will be with the same level of enthusiasm, right? I've got this great idea, da, 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 and they go, whoa, whoa, wow, wow, you know? They may respond with the same level of enthusiasm, right? Or they may not. That means you change your rhythm. All right, I got a question for you right there. It just occurred to me. So here you are a musician. You've built this great career doing this. When was the moment you realized this sort of thing in communication and business going on and saying, geez, what I'm doing here is the dance that's happening over here in this deal going on. I can bring this idea of rhythm and melody and harmony to this. Can you take us to that moment where you had this aha that you could you know, evolve out of music and into the business world? It, I can absolutely take you there. It, I can actually pinpoint it. It happened around 1992, 93. I'm working with Earth, Wind and Fire. We're going around the world. It's an incredible, mind-blowing experience. Um, and I get contacted by the lady who represents Deepak Chopra. And uh, Deepak Chopra at the time is a rising star who is bringing concepts of mindfulness and meditation to the West. And uh, he shows up in Los Angeles speaking at Warner Brothers at the lot uh, for, the, for, for, the, for the entertainment industry. And everyone's captivated by this new energy of Deepak Chopra. Um, and that night I was invited and there was a meeting set up between he and I. Turns out that he likes Earth, Wind & Fire a lot. 
And he also knew about my music. My, my first album had come out. And, he, and we met and he said, Freddie, I want to write a song with you about meditation. And the name of the song, the thing I like to talk about is the space between thoughts. And I call that space between thoughts, the gap. And so we got together a week later and we started writing a song and the song is called Slip in the Gap. And it's on my second album, Soul to Soul. And in the process of writing that song, I realized how important it was to have the space between thoughts. In other words, if you, if you learn meditation and you learn to shut off all the chatter in your brain, amazing things happen. Amazing things happen. You realize that, there's, that you have this, what I call the internal dialogue in your brain all the time. And it, it can pollute. It's sort of like, you know, if you, if you eat pizza and drink sugary soda your whole life and you can't calm it down, it's, that's the feeling. It's this bad, uh, untamed nature of the internal dialogue. It, 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 if you can master it, in other words, if you can calm it down, get it to get still, activate it, then it becomes an incredible tool for living. Your brain, three pounds of gray matter between your ears, you know, just taming that. So I was fascinated by the power to be able to, to, to slow down my thoughts. And I ended up taking up meditation because of that experience. So when did it happen? Around 1992. And then when we wrote the song and put it out there, and if you look at the lyrics, it's all about accessing the power of the gap, the beauty of what's in between one thought to the next. And then I realized that that's the way music works. The difference between Lady Gaga and Adele and Bruno Mars singing the same song is the space they go from one note to the next. Some of them sing it quickly, some sing it with slowness. John Legend sings it in a different way than Adele would, right? Um, Frank Sinatra, whatever you're into. What makes the flavor different for each musical artist is the space between the notes. And that opened up the connection between music and thought and timing. And that's how I, and then shortly after that, right after I started working with Deepak, I got a call to work to, uh, here I am, by the way, I'm working with Al Jarreau now. Uh, by that point, Al Jarreau is the only artist who won a Grammy in R&B, jazz, and pop. He's another mind-blowing, <laughs> he's a force of nature, Al Jarreau. You know, Freddie, I got, to sh I got to shoot pool with Al Jarreau when I was a junior in college at Washington State University. I was on the Performing Arts Committee. We brought in all the bands, all the groups. He came in and played, and he looked at me when he was all said and done, and he said, where can we go shoot pool? And I took him down to a little hangout in Pullman, Washington, and got to shoot pool with Al Girol all evening. Pretty fun. So, so you you remember what a beautiful man he is? Yes. Right? Oh yeah. He, he was. He's a delightful soul. He's like a. He's laughing a lot. He's fun, and he's a mind blowing artist, right? So you know. Well, I, I had the pleasure of working with Al for seven years, and and he he came. He came to this studio that I'm talking to you from right now many, many times. And we, we wrote title tracks of albums from, from, from this room. Um, but I will tell you that Al is um, working with Al and then coming out of the experience with Deepak. In that period of my life, late, uh, late 90s, 97, 98, I started getting calls from speakers bureaus. Because they said, Freddie, you know, we, we heard that you're presenting these ideas. And it first started when I was working with Deepak. Deepak would hire me to go and speak to his seminars. Um, and I would be speaking with seminars, but I always had a piano with me. And I would use the piano to illustrate what I was saying. And he loved it. You know, he said, Freddie, you could talk about meditation, but you could use the piano to do it. This Can is you give us an example of that? Sure, sure. If you're, uh, uh, if you're thinking about um, uh, a rhythm like this. By the way, this is a song I wrote called Water. But left hand is 
kind of like a motor, like the flow of water, it doesn't stop, like a, a stream, a river. And then the melody on top of it. sense of space if I want to play it with no space and make it like a flurry Notice my left hand just stays like an engine. It's a constant. Right hand. is the business storytelling lesson in that? The business story lesson in that is there are times where your passion will take off like an eagle in flight. You're excited about your product. You're excited about your idea. You're excited about innovation. And you're excited where it's going to go. But you're also taking into consideration that you might have challenge. there's going to be resistance. And so maybe you just need to stay in a couple notes, focus on one area. Don't change. Find your notes. I'm staying in one range. I'm not trying to do everything. These are some of the ways you can use music to actually talk about life activities and where you stay. Most entrepreneurs are, in, are driving in 10 different lanes. They're doing everything. And the only reason I know that's true is because I've been guilty of that. And then eventually, over the course of time, you realize, stay in your lane and have other people who can focus and master those other lanes do that for you. And fortunately, I have an amazing team of people around me that do that for me now. But, <laughs> you know, uh, until I figure that out, uh, you know, you're all over the place. Well, you realize that uh, as you learned the, uh, um, what was your first instrument? Uh, uh, accordion. Thank you. I was spacing that out. As you were learning the accordion, that was your first step to being a one-man band. You could have added yeah. the drums to it and everything else, but we all know that that one man band thing just doesn't really work very well. It's a nice little sideshow on the street corner and people throw some nickels in your hat, felt hat sitting out there. But in business, you can't do that. You can't get away with that. You can't do that. And, and I think what maybe the one, the one word that is uh, very relatable to everything we're talking about is the rhythm of things. You know, the rhythm is everything. Uh, you know how we say timing is everything? Timing, right? You could mm -hmm. have the greatest ideas, the most amazing invention. You could have a, you could have a heart of gold. You could, you could want to save the world. Your intention is positive, but if your timing hits the market at the wrong time, it, everything goes down the drain, right? So it's important if you want to align yourself up with success that you're in sync mm -hmm. with what's coming up. Or your, you know, the twenty-year overnight success. You know, you've spent all this time getting your product ready for market. You've spent your time, and you, and when the, when the timing comes, when the world is in need, you're already there because you've been investing and anticipating where the market's going to go. That means you're in rhythm. You found the right tempo for your product and or your services. 
So I, I, I'm using music to really talk about alignment when things are right. Freddie, this has been just absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for being here. Where can people learn more about you and the work? I mean, you're called the keynote maestro and we can see why that is now, but where can people learn more about you and even bring you into their world to help teach? Absolutely. Um, if everyone uh, can visit lifeintune.com, they'll see uh, how to reach us and how to reach my team and reach me. And uh, we're here to serve. We're here to help connect the dots and help people have far greater levels of success. Oh, <clears throat> well, this has just been absolutely awesome. Would you do me a huge favor, mm. not only just being on the show, but would you play me out? Would you play a oh. little something and I'll close the show. And as I'm going along, we'll see, it, it, here'll be a test. I'll throw in a couple of different you know, ideas and storytelling and let's do a little text painting and hear your improvisation on how you would play off of that. A text painting, okay. So, um, I, so to give me a sense of that. So you're so going to give me a, you're going to give me some ideas. We're going to start with excitement because I'm so excited to have you here. Okay. And then we're going to take it down into you know what this storytelling is kind of hard. You got to practice it. It's like playing the keyboard. You got to practice it every day. And then we're going to resolve it on. We're here to help you do just that. So okay. it's a setup, it's a problem, it's a resolution we're gonna close on. How does that sound? So good, uh, uh, let, uh, okay, you, I've, I've got an idea. All right. Uh, I, think, I think because you mentioned problem, let's talk about a quick problem and then we're gonna give the solution. So one of the problems uh, is people have an idea Right? It don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. They've got an, <laughs> uh, they've got something, but it's not swinging. You know, it's just not right. It, it almost feels like the left hand. Everything's off. The melody's right, the ideas are good, the intention is good. The left hand is playing the right chords, but they're completely out of sync with each other. And I just want to say, I think the problem that so many people face right now is the world feels out of sync, with, especially with COVID. So, let's so I, that's the problem. How okay. do we get back in sync, okay? So I'm going to start playing um, out of sync. And then you're going to just tell me whatever you want to tell me. And the goal is to get back into sync, right? You got it. Okay. okay. Here so, we go. You get. Oh. Well, thanks for listening to this edition of the Business of Story. I hope you like what you heard. And you can use these storytelling techniques in your world. But you know what? It takes a lot of practice to find that rhythm where he talked about the melody your personality starts coming out it's going to be there no matter what oh and now you step it up a little bit and you've got this harmony going where you are starting to collaborate with others around you because of the stories you are telling them and it's the rhythm now all of a sudden everybody is in sync doing their thing the way you want because you have shared your vision with the world, with them, of the world, with them. Oh, yeah. And things just take off here at the Business of Story. And that's my job is to bring you amazing story artists like Freddie Ravel right here. If I can be of service to you, visit me over at the Business of Story. And until next week, when we will have another amazing story artist right here for you. The most important story you'll ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. Thanks for listening. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Bart! High five, high five, man. Bam! That was fun, Freddie. Man, and you just ran with it. You were just like, mm. <laughs> you were, I, I could, I said, oh, wait, part, wait, when's he going to like? And then you started, and then we went. <laughs> that was I loved it.
That's what you call jazz. Right? Uh, yeah, that's improvisation at its best right there, folks. That's Grammy award-winning improvisation <laughs> right there. Throw an Academy Award in there too while we're Oh, why it. not? Why not? Uh, you know? Thanks, Freddie, and thank you all for listening. Great fun. All right, take care.